Well, it, it really is probably in the, the last week or so before something dramatic is going to happen. In terms of the Western embassies evacuating from Kiev, what we've seen in recent years with uh, the attack on the diplomatic, uh, lo the U.S. diplomatic location in Benghazi, Libya, and then the evacuation seemingly very quickly happening in Kabul, Afghanistan, all these different governments don't want to be in a position where they are evacuating people under duress and quickly. The, that doesn't look good at home. But in terms of what is happening on the border, you know, estimates range up to 175,000 troops uh, in uh, Belarus, uh, Russia, and of course in Crimea, uh, one, one of the pieces of land that is disputed between Ukraine and Russia. So that is a a fair majority of Russia's combat potential. And so if they're doing this just to, um, you know, just create headlines, create coercion, and to try and change what Ukraine is thinking is possible in terms of its national development, then sure. But it, it seems like uh, that the demands that Russia has placed on not merely Ukraine, but NATO writ large and the United States specifically, indicates that Russia is not going to be satisfied with small concessions or temporary concessions. Mm. We have plenty to unpack there, Yuval. You know, but despite this, what's happening on the border, the talks are going on. You know, last week, we had the French president in Moscow. This week, it'll be the German chancellor. Do you see any movement, any progress? Because it sounds like both sides are just reiterating the same points and their respective red lines over and over. So sure, and, and even the uh, the Brazilian president will be traveling to Moscow on, on Wednesday, the uh, the date that ostensibly is going to be uh, the invasion day. But what we've seen is that the big idea that President Putin, you know, in terms of the signaling from him, the people around him, is that they anticipated when they started this entire process in April of last year, which then picked up the pace in November of last year, is that the West was, you know, from their perspective, the West was in decline, the West was not united. And I think what they underestimated was the NATO cohesion and the amount of, in effect, leadership that both the United States and France were willing to show in order to maintain, you know, the support to Ukraine. So now they're in a position where they did not, I don't, I personally don't believe that they anticipated it would get to this level, that they thought it was going to be uh, many more concessions imposed on Ukraine from its partners in the West in order to bring, not to come to um, something this dramatic. But now that we are where we are, things such as, uh, you know, reuniting with uh, Belarus or placing, you know, 30,000 Russian troops, which are there for exercises, placing them permanently or recognizing Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, the separatist held areas as independent states like Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Georgia. Those are things that could have been possible without this military buildup. So now that they have this military buildup, in effect, they're in a position where if they don't use it, then the lesson that the U.S., Ukraine, NATO, everyone will take is if you stand up to Vladimir Putin and to Russia, it's not going to be pleasant, but you're not going to get anything truly bad to happen. Mm. And that is the in essence, the strategic uh, dilemma that Putin has imposed, and which is, of course, the most dangerous for the security of Europe, probably at any time since World War II. So at this point, do you think Russia still holds the power in all of this? So in terms of power, I mean, even the, the other day, President Macron of France said that if uh, Russia wants to revise the 1997 NATO-Russia um, founding act, which is one of the main um, requests that Russia did. Like Russia has said that it wants all NATO members who joined after 1997 to no longer be NATO members, no NATO forces to be in those territories, which is basically Eastern Central Europe. So Macron to that said that if, you know, the understandings from Russia's perspective are going to be revised, then from the Western perspective, that means reimposing missile defense systems and offensive missile systems all along Russia's borders. So they're willing to play it on both sides. What we can see in terms of which country is going to invade another country or further invade another country, that's only Russia. This entire issue has come up because Russia has, in, a, in effect, identified Ukraine as being the key to their great power aspirations. And they've given Ukraine three options. They can join Russia's versions of the EU and NATO. It can stay out of any potential um, you know, larger institution or it can face the consequences of the Russian armed forces. 
And so between you become part of us, you join nobody, or we're going to destroy you, that's in effect, those are all choices that are made by Russia to Ukraine. And what President Putin and his people are in effect challenging the United States and NATO to do is to ask, what are you going to do about it? Mm. And at that point, that's where we still are. What is the, the West writ large going to do in case of actual conflict uh, that will happen, you know, that might happen this week or next?